deep sad. I want to make sure we capture it. <laughs> yeah, I mostly just work on uh, work on right now. We're working on some articles, trying to out like sort of put some stakes in the ground. What do we mean by wisdom to be able to explain it to people without watching fifty hours of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah wisdom is a tricky topic right especially the way he talks about it it's not like a simple like oh be wise and you know mm. repeat this phrase a lot or think about a simple thing it's a whole model of intelligence and imagination and personality and distributed versions of those things and yeah. then like within the world like I don't even know I've never really asked John what his view of the world is but it's probably mm. like a complicated thing uh, <laughs> yeah yeah i'm trying to like boil that down at the moment um not like in some sense to capture something about it that's understandable and still leave you with the awareness that you don't understand it it's just pointing towards something like it's not mm. a full explanation yep. of what it is uh just like a sort of definition that outlines what space are we working in right now that's kind of what I'm working yeah on. where are you at do you have like a working definition like from psychology there's like operationalizing concepts so this is easy to talk about <laughs> yeah i mean currently i do but it's not like um i'm meeting with john and zach stein and uh rick repetti okay. tomorrow oh my god and then they'll be probably well hopefully tearing it apart and putting it back together and helping me to define a little more clearly but i've I'm currently conceptualizing it in terms of view, care, and action, and just a lot aligning things. Care and action. Okay, I think I can follow that a little bit. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, like the view being sort of, uh, like if you take it in terms of like salience, landscape, and so attention and awareness, and sort of this figure ground movement. Okay. Okay. They talked. Having like, John and Layman talked about that a little bit. In one of their episodes about the stereoscopic gripping on multiple mm. levels um yeah so the view would yeah. be kind of some of that yeah yeah and i mean in that sense just getting insight sort of better problem formulation what am i like what am i trying to do and how and how am i trying to solve this problem mm -hmm. and getting a better way to frame the problem and better so i'm paying attention to the right things um in order to solve my problem more elegantly uh -huh. um and that has to be brought in alignment with care. Right. In that sense, like agape, um, sort of this, like deep, um, the deep, like sort of an emotional sense of what's good, what's true, what's beautiful. Um, and in that realm, we often encounter like distortions because of uh, trauma, different kinds of experiences we've had that like cause us to, to distort the way that we care. So we're not always caring about what's good and true and beautiful. Sometimes we're caring about, like it's distorting our way of caring, saying like, oh, I'm, I feel helpless. I feel insignificant. I feel lonely. Right, um, these caring habits almost. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. ways that like, when that, when those tensions get stuck in the body, you, you end up distorting your sense making of like, what's good, what's, what's beautiful. Um, what should, and, and I mean, these things are all interpenetrating, but like then the third yeah. aspect is action. So sort of, uh, in, in John's sense, like phronesis, like skillful application of like, how do I respond in this context? Like, how do I act here? Cause it's okay. not, I want to be, maybe I have like an insight that, about like how to be caring and I, and it's like resonant in my heart if you will <laughs> like uh -huh. i really want to be caring but it's going to be different in this context in this context in this context so i have to learn how to be caring in different contexts and um mm -hmm. and practice that and over time i'm developing like virtuous character through action and all of these things are like interpenetrating right so they're right not... they're feeding back into each other and so your actions yeah. then become like unconscious food for your care and they're like validating and challenging your care and your worldview and then your yeah. worldview is validating and challenging your actions and your care and they're all just kind of like when they're in harmony you're just like oh i'm not even really thinking i'm just caring and acting and being or something like that yeah uh -huh. yeah 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 mm -hmm. and one, one thing that i'm not sure like this this maps on pretty well to a lot of other systems um 
and I'm the one thing that it leaves out that's like sort of glaring to me at the moment is uh, is like mystical experience sort of at the end of the <laughs> well, right. Yeah. So I'm talking to Arthur versus Lewis, hopefully later this month. Do you know his work at all? I don't know. He John cites a couple of his books and I met with him and John a couple of times and he wrote like kind of the book on mysticism. He has a book called uh, Platonic Mysticism. And it's just like a, it's got a gloss almost like you really get introduced some good vocabulary and models of these different people over the last 2000 years. And it's just a really good history of like the Neoplatonic Christian kind of path from Plato to now, like to 1950 maybe, or something like that. There's not like a list of current mystics to follow around these days or anything <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, it's a problem, right? Because when you start having mystical experiences, what where do you put the symbols, right? These symbols are both like archetypal potentially and personal, they can be full of bias, right? Like a, a mm -hmm. mystical experience has almost the most potential for bullshitting. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and yeah, yeah I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm talking to him. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so this is like the the needle that I'm trying to thread there is something like looking at how do I explain this to the average person in a way that they can see like what, what I'm talking about. And the average person, I would, well, in my experience, so maybe I'm just moving in certain circles, but the average person, uh, doesn't really have hasn't cleared out enough of their emotional blockage uh -huh. and had the kind of like and have the kind of insight into a worldview that's like sort of beyond scientific materialism um and doesn't like so there, there's some there are like blocks to mystical experience yeah for sure and, i mean purification is kind of Plotinus's maybe first or second step depending on how you mm. look at his work and um, I think every tradition has that, right? Like uh, more morality and ritual and all of that is trying to unblock a lot of that trauma, right? Or, or that just bias you built up is maybe a more neutral word than trauma. Yeah, like, well, I mean, just experiences that like leave your nervous system in a sort of like, um, or the way that I think about it anyway, is that mm -hmm. you get you get sort of sensitized to like, the, there's a danger here. And when you're in this danger state in the state of contraction, like you can't, you're not open to this mystical experience. I suppose mm -hmm. you might, it might be best to talk about it um, just in terms of flow. Like when you're in flow. Oh yeah, yeah. People, but, but it's like one of these things where it's hard to find that like, where does this really relate to the average person's experience? And doesn't start to sound like some kind of esoteric thing that I'm like pitching to you, but rather just trying to get you to look at your own experience. Yeah. Well, with virtue, you're you're dealing with like conformity theory, right? You want like the, I think John's talked about like the psychological bleed of I'm closer to goodness and I don't like turn it into propositions or start like pasting it into my life, but it permeates and kind of disrupts the way I'm looking at things and I might catch myself looking at things differently and go, Oh, she's not an object. Oh, <laughs> like that is an object. Like that's not a person. Like my computer is not a person or something like right. that. Like, and you, yeah. you have these little moments that kind of uh, like our little epiphanies from your practice. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's another thing that's very difficult is to like get people to turn from trying to understand the model as just propositionally <laughs> to like p seeing my experience, ex understanding my experience directly in these terms. Mm -hmm. Like I have a, a meditation that I made um, oh, cool. trying to like, so I was, I've always been very fascinated with how can I take these complex subjects and put them into more simple terms. Uh, and so the concept of affordances by Gibson and the concept of schemata from Piaget, I tried to make into like very simple language that my, my target audience is somebody like my mom or something yeah. <laughs> who doesn't have a deep philosophical background uh, and wouldn't, I, I could explain these things. And if I did explain them or when I have explained them to people, it often ends up that they start, they, they struggle and try to understand the thing as a proposition and then they feel like they've gotten it when they understand how that works, like this model of things works. Uh -huh. and, I, and I'm like, yes, I mean, that's good. It's not a bad thing, but 
at the same time, if you don't look and see like, okay, this cup is graspable in my experience, like that, and then like start to see like, oh, things have possibilities. I can do something with that. Um, or like, I can look over there and there's a towel over here. I can imagine like what it would feel like to touch that without actually experiencing it because it's like sort of stored in my memory of experiences that I've had before. And so this is like how memory affects the way that I'm making sense of the world. But if I, I mean, if I just get this like, okay, memories and uh, effect, or memories are inherent in my experience. It's like, okay, as a concept, that's good. But like, can you see it right <laughs> in your actual experience? Can you like, can you start to recognize this? Um, the affordances, the schemata. And, and so I made this meditation where you go to a park. Um, it's just this audio meditation. You go to a park and you pick up a rock and you press play and it kind of walks you through like, see this experience it like, yeah 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 oh, wow. yeah you'll love this i was at the beach two days ago and i was doing a bunch of just practices and part of what my practice is i concentrate and sometimes like on a dot or a candle and i just concentrated on this shell because i wanted to look at something that like my attention could go back to a lot and it wasn't like if i pick something too simple or too weird i'll like start looking at everything so I'm like okay this is the shell i'm committed to this shell and for like i don't know eight or ten minutes I just concentrated on that shell. And like in that concentration, I was worlded in a whole different way. Like the whole rest of the thing around the shell and behind me and in front of me kind of shifted into mm. where, okay, now I'm in nature and I'm just noticing what's happening. I'm not like on the beach at my goal, doing my things. And it yeah. just pulled me out of that um, through concentrating on an object outside of me. Um, yeah. Yeah, do you know this thing? Have you ever um, read uh, Chula Dasa's The Mind Illuminated? No, no, but it sounds like Honestly. a great title, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, John Yates was this guy. He died recently, but he was, uh, his sort of Dharma name was Chula Dasa. Okay. And he, he does this uh, as an initial practice. Um, he's a certain, I mean, I'm no expert, <laughs> but he's in a certain vein of uh, Vipassana. And one of the first things that he'll have people do is to like, concentrate on an object and then notice how as you concentrate on it longer and longer that your peripheral awareness comes more into focus right and you right sort of come into this yeah so it's really it's, that sound reminded me of, of what you were doing there yeah. i love diffuse awareness i listened to this woman like i don't know 20 years ago and she just talked about how diffuse versus concentrated awareness works and i just try to have that happen yeah. um and you get this kind of like anagage sometimes yeah. where oh i'm in like the world not my world <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and there's like some at some point at least in my experience there's the possibility of this expanded sense of self like of course um, yeah because you identify with like you're the world right like mm. and other people yeah. are the world you like, there's even like an expanded place for other people almost mm. yeah um, yeah and stopping like this well, it's just a natural and maybe and sometimes very useful and, and important function to like identify myself as my body or in my head. There are these different views, these stories. But when you start to expand it, you start like, uh, I don't know, it's one, one of the, uh, who was that said that? I just don't, don't want to be acting like this is my idea, but like. Um, We're all borrowing was, but, great ideas. Yeah, 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 sure, of course. I think it was like uh, Sadhguru, this guy was talking about like, and nobody has to tell me not to bite off my little finger, you know? So like when I start to expand my identity um, to include others, like there's, there's, I wouldn't hurt you. Like why, why was just like, I wouldn't like slam my hand in a car door. I, why would I do that? Like, of course I won't do that. Yeah. Violence is so weird when you really think about like, yeah. it's the weirdest like impulse. It has to be almost like a primate impulse or something like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I, that's, I, I don't even know to be honest, like why there are lots of reasonable stories why that could be uh, a thing that happens for us. And I'm sure that it has a lot to do with that. Or it seems I don't I wasn't trying to make possible. a deep claim. I was just like, it's just weird to me. It just seems like once you kind of grow up and realize like it hurts to be hurt, you should stop wanting to hurt people. And like yeah. you're saying like, you just like, are, oh, this is me. This is this is our place. Yeah. The world is our place. It's not like uh, movie theater through a trash in or something like that yeah yeah and just like this there's just this natural I mean of course again like 
beyond distorted care that can make me then like lash out because I'm like, no, I won't be, I feel like, you know, you're ignoring me and that makes me feel worthless. And then I just like, Oh yeah. yeah. Stop this. And it's like, actually there's an internal process here that needs to be cleaned up. Yeah, yeah. And once I've done that and I'm like, Oh, okay. So I'm just here and I'm like loving awareness. I mean, it's, there's a lot of, um, this is just basic, like, like basic, but it's like, you know, spread throughout all of the wisdom traditions these these kinds of concepts but yeah just learning to for me it's like learning different ways of looking different views that allow me to experience the world directly this way Mm -hmm. like not and so like I won't be violent and not because I have some kind of like moral code that says like don't be violent but right right same way that I won't yeah run into a wall on purpose like it's like why well that's a great analogy yeah but i love the way you keep putting it in these simple analogies it's like my my one of my uh, instructors is kind of the same way it's like it's easy to be nice like he doesn't even pontificate on niceness or compassion he's like that's easy we've got that like it's so easy you're overthinking it um mm. and and i do that i go like oh i'm probably just overthinking this whole social frame right now let me just it's simple. It's not that complicated. Like, just don't be a jerk. And then what do you want or what's going on? Like, mm, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's practice and like, yeah, it's very practice. Yeah. It's like, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I still feel like a baby when I interact with people, like some of the monks at monastic Academy or other people. And I'm just like, Oh gosh, <laughs> you're so like, if you practice this for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, you've just, it's you become something well you become wise that's kind of the the premise of this whole like concept of wisdom as i'm trying to help simplify and define it to say like it's not becoming some enlightened being on a different plane it's just becoming like i mean sore you i don't know if you ever listened to sore you for all he's like the bit. teacher at the monastic academy yeah i know he's, of him yeah yeah and he talks about that like you're just becoming the most normal person like mm-hmm. you're not becoming anything special. <laughs> you're just the most normal person. And and that is, in some ways, it is special because we're all so we're all walking around, or so many people are walking around with like just in their head, like disconnected from their body, disconnected from care, not really reflecting on their actions, mm-hmm. like stuck in a view that's very like constricted. And um, yeah, I was just actually talking to um one of the monks, the do you have you ever met Satian? You met Seishin. You took yeah, the yeah, course. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to her yesterday <laughs> and she was, uh, I was trying to, one of the things, one of the other things that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create this like simple model that I could start a conversation with somebody in a coffee shop and have them understand what I mean by wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was asking her about like simple practices. Like one of the, that's another sort of thing that I'm trying to find, like elegant yeah. little practices that could open somebody up just a little bit to get them curious about where does this path lead and uh, why, why might I, like, I want to, I want to get somebody excited about, you know, starting to practice. Um, I'm, I'm with you. She said like, uh, yeah, well it is, but she said, and she pointed to this thing, which was like, I was like, wow, yeah, that's, that's actually quite true. Uh-huh. M- most people have developed these coping strategies to deal with like the deep discomfort that they feel most of the time. Okay. And so yeah. when you, if you like crack somebody open, uh, yeah, yeah. Their, their experience initially is might not be one that they, they're like, oh, I really want to go there because the first thing they have to do is to like learn to sit with that discomfort. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of catharsis that might need to take place if their psycho emotional system is like really twisted. Right. Um, before they start to be like, oh, wow, this is great. And that's so, actually, I think that that's validated by a lot of like work that, that nonprofits do, right? Is that they care about the basic, basic person way before they get to like building up their intellect mm, mm. And, and like, okay, are you fed? Are you sleeping? Are you away from your bad friends? Are you, do you have like a simple job? Are you doing just these basic, basic, basic things? And then once you've got that, okay, well now let's open you up and really start building you Hmm. after like that. But I think that is, it is a tough thing because it's almost like, like you said this last time that it's tough. It's so easy to be good in a monastic container 
<laughs> because it's just like nature and good people and simple life and good books and yeah. that's it like you're like oh this is good there's bliss everywhere it's awesome but then you go back out and there's all these kind of just existentially broken people right like i hate using that kind of language but it's just like like there's guarded just traumatized people and so you're trying to like break through and just habitual like the bullshitting in our society is it's not even just like passively pernicious like it's actively trying to get you to desire more and to like spend more than you have and to have shallow friendships and as soon as you like that's fighting your whole system right there yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah and so i really i'm really curious she gave, she gave me a couple of tips yeah yeah uh, and i think that that there there are things kind of that allow people to to titrate a bit like so that they don't go full on into their discomfort and pain but still get a little bit of insight uh -huh. but it's it's such a yeah it's what's such the a element wild. of surprise like what can you do <laughs> well one of the things that she she suggested was just doing these basic parts exercises because oh, you yeah. can still kind of stay in your head with it like if yeah, you do yeah. real focusing you're going down into the discomfort and like um some people might be re reticent or not really even understand how to do that uh -huh. um, um because the, all their you know initially your whole psyche is built to like not feel that thing so it's hmm. uh it, it can be really difficult to get someone to tune into the felt sense and like the vagueness of it and not just speak from their head. Uh -huh. But if you, if you talk about parts in some ways, like it's the, it's a, there's like a, the ability to stay still kind of in your head and just like recognize these different parts of you that are in conflict and want different things. Yeah. Like uh, I remember in the course, they talked about like the guardian that, that, like guards the uh, yeah protectors the, yeah and, the protectors so like maybe yeah. you could like encounter a protector and have some kind of like dialogue with a simple like external part of someone's psyche yeah and then this just gives people like the ability to kind of still stay in this very heady mode but uh -huh. nevertheless access something about like oh yeah i'm not just a person who thinks something like i'm i'm a sort of collection of sub-personalities that are like maybe battling with each other and that it can even even that can break somebody open a little bit like sort of uh this yeah it's, it's so weird because because we do just have like psychic reserves right because it makes sense as a, as a being that's going to be in a bunch of situations we need to be able to like pull out personality and deal with things but then push it away you can't have like the love of your child in your head when you're at war trying to defend mm. your child even <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, you, well, it, it's a very paradoxical within a person to deal yeah, with some and of I mean things. even when you're like interacting with your child like you know there yeah. may be like parts of you that are like want to be open and loving and parts of you that like are worried about uh paying the bills and parts of you that are like uh just wanting to rest and all kinds right. of different things that are like in sort of tension with each other mm -hmm. and just recognizing that for some people is is like a good step because they're they're just in this conflict and they feel so like caught in it mm -hmm. and they don't they're like um in this caught you know it's just like john's uh anxiety perennial problem anxiety is really weird right like i've been reading some existentialists and they all talk about anxiety right like it's a part of being or something and i don't ever think that way i'm not a very anxious person i have pretty low neuroticism mm -hmm. and um those kind of things and i have awareness of what it, neuroticism is as a construct and and but it, it's very interesting that there is like always this the combinatorial explosion of life seems to like create anxiety in us or something like that like it's just yeah. part of, of being yeah <laughs> yeah it's difficult and but then when you when you can learn like so i mean in this way of thinking i suppose like in the internal family systems way you'd say like self is the kind of like cop self with a capital s is a kind of uh harmonizing field in which you can hold all these sub personalities and so like the anxiety releases because you're you're actually able to bring like care to all of the parts of you mm -hmm. all these different sort of motivations desires whatever needs whatever you want to define them as. I mean, uh -huh. I think it's good to be a bit like loose with all of that because it is whatever we, whatever, because of this, this deep 
nature. Well, you don't want to reify it. You don't want to bullshit yeah. yourself in this process. Like those are both just perennial <laughs> dangers of these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so if you, but if you take it lightly and you say like, okay, there are these different parts of myself and you don't reify them, um, then how can I find a field in which I can hold all those parts um, mm -hmm. with love and sort of allow them to be and be grateful and thankful to them for what they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Protect me and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, the so Stoics have similar things with the archetypes and like just identifying anger and lust and uh, intellectualization and just like going like, oh, yeah, I've had those feelings. I've been overtaken by those gods. And like, let me let me figure out, like, who are those gods and are they showing up when I'm not even aware of that? And then you can start to say a lot more and appreciate them. Right. Like, ultimately, you don't want to just like go like, ah, I've got anger and now I can deal with it more. You want to mm. go, OK, well, what is that like? what is the rest of that? What's the context and the, you know, all of the other layers of the onion that are associated with these, uh, uh, like automatic personalities, these like mm. unconscious spirits or whatever we want to call them. Yeah. Um, forces. yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, what was it that you uh, were most interested in, um, in meeting about? Yeah, just practicing and, and trying to live the good life, really, and, and like learn from you a little bit and talk about practices. Because um, I live this whole world too. Like, I don't have any meetings with Zach and Rick talking about these things, but I just live in this world and talk to a lot of other people about these things all the time. And I don't know, I love Buddhism. I have a lot of friends that like are kind of more secular but i just love that you're just into buddhism you're not like oh it's this weird thing. i don't know tell me about your buddhism could you just tell me about oh, that or yeah sure yeah um well i guess like for me it's very practice oriented like uh -huh. I'm, I'm getting more and more into learning about the the sort of concepts the eightfold path different things and learning how, how does that like resonate with me but the main thing is just doing samadhi practice right now, like for the last couple of years, um, uh -huh. getting deep into, I don't know if you know Rob Berbea. I know of him. Yeah. I've never met him. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually uh, Daniel put me on to Daniel Thorson, put me on to listening to Rob Berbea. Um, there's a, on, there's a website called org, And uh -huh. if you go on there, there's like a, he gives just tons of talks and Dharma talks and guided meditations from all kinds of people. And Rob has stuff on there specifically. Um, what I started with was from on Daniel's recommendation was a, a retreat called the art of concentration. Uh -huh. And this is where Rob like really goes into how to do basic, what they call like energy body practice. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this is like a kind of Samadhi meditation where you're, basically tuning into like when I started I was tuning into like my whole the field of my body uh, like imagining it as a field of energy mm -hmm. and a little bit more than your body so you ex experience yeah. try to like feel all of your body and, and a little bit outside of your body and um, so you're doing that and you're also tuning into like where is there like some small amount of comfortableness like something that feels kind of good and then not and it, it's it's a weird it's weird like rob describes this much better than i am currently but like you can't really like force it but in a certain kind of like tuning into that like say my my arm my right arm feels really comfortable right now right and then by tuning into it i can like try to expand that awareness of this comfort until it includes more of my body and then all the way out to like where it's more than my body mm -hmm. um and you do this uh and over time like and i mean over time like not you know in a week <laughs> but if you do it like consistently every day um eventually it start you, you kind of kick into these uh like deeper feelings of well-being uh mm -hmm. like in buddhism the first one is called piti and it's like um it's like a like a body buzz it feels like very much like you're it feels like you're on some kind of drug almost just this like okay. this feeling of like it's, it translates as bliss huh. and uh, 
So you you go there and then there's like more steps and so it goes on and on and on. But uh, yeah, cultivating this, I think for me is like, it just changed my whole life because it, when you can tune in every, every day, I sit down on the cushion and for an hour, I tune into bliss and then happiness and then peace. Like I'm tuning into these things that are like present for me in my experience and not based on any kind of external conditions. So it give, it developed in me a kind of like independent confidence. Like I can right. take care of myself. Rob talks about like the, it's the cheetah. I think it's the, the mind body that like one of the, um, he says one of the, one of the tragedies of the world that we live in right now, especially in the West is that we, like the thing we need to make most take care of is sort of our mind body is like the thing we most need to take care of and the thing we least know how to take care of. And this feels like, I don't know, um, as essential as like, it's like the difference between like when you've gone two, three days and you haven't taken a shower and you feel like just gross. Yeah, <laughs> and then yeah. you get in there and you soap up and you like, oh, and it feels good. And then you come out and you just feel like fresh and new and open and like, yeah, yeah. Oh. It's like that, but for uh, like my direct experience, it's kind of mm. taking this like time every day allows me to come back to whatever I'm doing with this feeling of like, all right, yeah, good. Okay, good. I'm open, I'm happy, I'm calm, mm -hmm. I'm connected, I'm caring, all the, the C words from internal family systems, whatever you want to say. Um, but yeah, so for me, like my Buddhism is very much praxis oriented. It's this. Okay. Yes, that's great. I, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, I just, I then at various times when I find, when I find the time to like deep dive deeper into it, I get into, yeah, for example, looking now at like at the Eightfold Path and trying to really connect uh, because it's that the problem is like in the past, I would have, I've maybe learned about these things before. Like I, I studied uh, religion and culture at one point. Yeah, yeah. And, you were like a... path. and then you're, you have this like concept and this model and you're like, oh, okay, God, so I get it. But actually like, what does it, what does right view mean? What does uh -huh. like, you know. What does it feel different... like? What does it look like in my life? Yeah. What is it not just like, do I have eight ways to say it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm looking at things in a certain way and like that matters and how am I looking at it and how can I look at it in a more uh, loving and compassionate way and trying to build these ways of looking into my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do that sometimes and uh, I don't know where that will go. Like maybe that will become like a deeper part of my practice, but right now it's mostly just like meditating. And then what's in the last, um, I guess since I left the monastery, which was like the deepest experience of that, that I've had, like practicing 94 days straight, just like, whoosh, uh, like now it's the integration of it has been like really learning how, so I have now like this, you know, usually an hour a day, um, sometimes a little bit more, but usually just an hour that I, I practice. And then so that's kind of like at the monastery, like there's this really easy game. Like I got, everything's just like, I'm just sitting here. <laughs> Nothing is happening. I've blocked off this hour. I can sit. Um, super easy to tune into things. And then the challenge is getting up off the cushion and staying with it mm -hmm. and, and coming back to it all the time. Like yeah, that's the fun part, right? Yeah. 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 This, so the new, the new like practice mode for me since I left there has been training myself to not just be in this state and this open awareness, like this open body state while I'm meditating, but also like coming back to it all the time, every step that I take, trying to like notice when I'm contracted, open up. Relax. Yeah. yeah. Like, mm, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause I like similarly, like if you can start to have a good sit and then bring it out into your rest of your life, right? Like that's powerful. John would always say that at the end of his meditations. Um, and you know, yeah, like it takes like a year to do that or something like that at a minimum. It takes a really long time. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, which I find just, which again, like I hope if, if one person meditated once because they saw my YouTube channel, 
Like mm. I just post it mostly for myself and just like, oh, I have all these, like I have the energy body meditation that in the course, I have it on my channel. And I've just, I think I've done 80% of the views. It's not a lot of views, but like I'm 80% of them. So I'm just picking on it, trying it. <laughs> and, you know, if someone else tries it, that's awesome because, um, you know, they might do more or, you know, get mm. more into it. And I think there's a lot of bad practices, but like there's a lot of good ones out there too. Like the energy body thing. I like it. I was telling you in that email um, during the, the two day weekend with John Guy and, and everybody, they have all these kind of breakout rooms to, to socially lubricate everybody and get everyone to try the social practices. So I was in this breakout room with this guy and we, we said a few things and I go, oh, that makes my shoulders relax. And just like, I could feel my scapulas just dropping down my back. And he's like, oh, now I can feel like some warmth in my belly. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that makes me so happy. I feel like my chest is raising up. And, and we just had this like five minute interaction that was all energy body or something like that. Nice. And it was great. And I realized like, oh, you can just do this. It was not narrative. There was no goals. There was not like an agenda, but it was like both of us felt completely happy with the whole five minutes. Like we were both like, yeah, I like you too. Have a great day. And I was like, yeah, I'm glad I met you too. Like it was a very warm moment that was only us talking about like our, our states of our body. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it gives you food for thought, right? Like it makes you think, oh, People could do this, not all the time. You wouldn't want to just sit in a circle, probably go like, oh, my shoulders, your shoulders. Like That'd be kind of weird after a while, but it's better than uh, going like, oh, bro, how's the football game? Or, oh, what have you bought lately? Like, what's cool on Amazon these days? Um, mm. And it was so not narrative. It was so yeah. not like a story we were sharing. Yeah. Yeah, it's this like basic, tuning into basic experience is such a powerful because it's just there like right is, and, and if it's, you, it's in the moment know, too it's yeah. there mm -hmm. like we're in the moment we're not in our heads when we're in the moment yeah we're just alive right now and that's mm -hmm. kind of crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and if you like drink it in uh it's it's just such a better way to be i think that's the problem or a big problem that i see is exactly this like Tuning into energy body, I mean, you sit in practice and you do it for a year and you're taking it off the cushion. That's awesome. And if you think about like, how do I get somebody, I mean, if I could just like zap somebody into, this is what it's like to walk around and be able to like tune into that. They'd be like, oh, I'll definitely dedicate a year to doing that. But how do I, you know, cause there's so many like snake oil salesmen like <laughs> so, much. so like i just yeah. tell somebody hey this is, this is this thing um yeah and it's like how do you really convince someone that it's worth putting in that much effort especially when the first part of it is still long hard slog of sitting with discomfort and like learning that it's okay learning to trust something bigger than the immediate contractions that i'm having and not react to them mm -hmm. um not feel like oh i gotta okay now i gotta like tell that guy because or like, oh, I've got to like go fix this thing. And it's like, right. well, well, stoicism okay. helped me with that. Like just, just yeah. stoic indifference. Like uh, I did a reading group and just going like, okay, all of this, I'm going to judge later. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to judge that later. Okay. I'm going to mm -hmm. judge. Oh, this is true. I like, I, I love privacy and quiet. So sometimes I'll be in like a sauna and just someone will come in and sit down and like unconscious sound like, ah, you know, and, and I just go, no, 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 that's me. That's me. I don't even know this guy. He's an angel. He's, he could be Jesus. Yeah. You know, I don't know this guy. And that indifference, eventually it kind of flipped in and I, I still am not perfect or anything like that, but like you can learn to have like a, a view from above or a, a detachment from the social and biological forces in far out of you it's 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 like mm -hmm. and it's it's freeing it really like you go oh that's awesome I just went to the gym and I wasn't annoyed by that guy like it really like immediately when you can kind of reflect on some of these things and go oh I went to the the woods and I just noticed the smells and the life and that was enough for me or whatever like it's, mm -hmm. it's such a it does have a lot of uh positive feedback pretty quickly when it works I guess yeah that was interesting yeah i mean anything i guess that drops somebody into that would be something very useful i'm trying to like yeah, i'm trying to collect like what are 
because I think it's going to be different for different folks, you know? Like, We're right. Uh, yeah. Individual differences. I studied for three years in organizational psychology. I was texting my friend last night who did like a, you know, hundred page dissertation and another hundred page masters on individual differences. And, you know, there is a gamut, especially when you start to get into age, because you're really not talking about people under 20 because those aren't like the, your target audience. So they're always, they have a history and all of these surface differences, like you might say. Um, mm. So yeah, it's so complicated. Like the methods are, are really good, but then fitting it to like people, that's the Socratic thing. It's like, oh, you're, you're not like a generic person. You're always <laughs> me and Nathan, right? Like I always yeah. have to fit myself to my students or to my boss or to my lover or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but you know, once you start to experience that sort of openness and freedom, your camera is being weird. Do you see it on, is stuttering on yours too? Oh, no, like, not for me. Uh, can you turn it off and back on? Maybe it'll just reset. It's like sure. lagging weird. Let me see Let me if that works. Okay, it's still like stuttering. That's fine though. It's, it's just a weird oh, yeah? visual. Thing. Okay. You look like an <laughs> 80s robot that's like kind of pausing and Max, yeah. Max Headroom. You do. That's exactly who you are right now. Yeah. <laughs> This is a pretty good reference for, uh, <laughs> for all the kids. <laughs> the, Max Headroom. Yeah, I think he drank uh, Crystal Pepsi once. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Crystal Pepsi. Uh, Ooh, that's back in the day. Well, yeah, I have, you know, not to, like my, my imagination and my memory is probably like my strength. When we talk about memory and things like that, like I remember everything. And, oh, man. Like, yeah, meditation helps me a lot. It's like it's, it is that double sword, though, because it can be super intense. But then yeah. it's like super stilling when you mm. get through that. Like, like just not doing is such a powerful practice um, mm. that I've learned from Buddhists and from, yeah. 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 I really wanted to like check some of that out. There's a, uh, cause I haven't really gone that far down practicing that, but there's, you know, Michael Taft, have you ever heard of him? No, no. He's a really cool cat. He's got a, a podcast called Deconstructing Yourself. I think that you would enjoy very much. Okay. Where he just talks with like high level meditators and uh, it's really, really interesting. But huh. uh, he has a practice called Dropping the Ball. And it's uh, one of these practices. And it's like, it's supposed to kind of get you into that, but the do nothing meditations pretty quickly. So. Uh-huh. I've been I've been interested out, yeah. in it, but I haven't been able to uh, haven't made the time to to check it out. But I, yeah, it sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. I just try to not do something. I just try to like I'll sit and instead of trying to meditate, I'll just try to like be. I guess. And if I have a thought or an urge, I just try to go like okay, let go of that, and just try mm. to do nothing. Yeah. And that helps a lot. Yeah. And also, Shinzen Young, he had this one meditation one time where it was just a pick one of your three modes, like visual, auditory, or feeling, and just kind of, sometimes when I'm standing, waiting for someone or in a line, I'll just go, okay, seeing, seeing, oh, hearing, hearing, oh, feeling, feeling, and just cycling through those three, like, external senses, hmm. and that does very good for me, too, usually, like, it just calms everything down, puts everything in its place, and hmm. detaches me from kind of, like, the mental chatter that I might have been engaging with nice yeah I've, I've heard also about that like i've heard him talk about this to hear feel method i haven't yeah yeah it's exactly i should do it yeah it's it good like yeah because because it's like i think part of construal the panic and the trauma is like he says it's like everything's at a thousand because it's all multi-channel if i can just kind of okay i got that channel it's all it's a one i actually wasn't even noticing how simple that channel was oh this channel it's a one, two. I was just, I was taking them all together. But when I look at them at one at a time, this is way simpler than I was feeling into. Mm. Um, yeah. So I love these little practices. I try Epicureanism and Stoicism and all of these kind of things there. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like too, like you were talking about music and guitar. I watched your, after we met, I watched your Stoa talk where you and AJ and Peter talked about how music was able to like kind of influence being and yeah. the, the, yeah, it's just so powerful that we're in this kind of Heideggerian linguistic analytical mode and we go, oh, music is words, but music is not. Music feels much more like the energy body and like a kind mm -hmm. of a persuasive, uh, 
I don't know. It's not analytical. It's very beautiful. I don't know. What do you think about about music? Yeah, yeah. I think for me, like it. I mean, there can be words, and then so it can combine into this like linguistic mode when you're doing songwriting, which one one of the things I like to do. But Uh it's. uh, I think it's actually just much more emotive. Like it comes like there the a melody, a rhythm, like evokes a certain felt sense, like a vibe or a. Yeah, some kind, and and when those, when that's, I mean, you can do a lot with it. So like, this isn't the only thing music is, but like when you strive to create beauty with that, then you're just sort of externalizing like an internal uh, experience and like sharing it. So it becomes like, sort of, it's almost as though like we as a group can experience emotion. I don't know if you've ever been to like, uh, like a concert and somebody's just like, killing it it's so beautiful and the whole crowd you just feel this like wow we're all feeling that same thing uh-huh. um, and so I don't know I think I think it's like uh it's interesting because there's that aspect where it's it can create this vibe socially mm-hmm. and then there's I mean we're also just like me as an individual sitting listening to a song I can even though the person's not there we have this affordance now with recordings yeah um but also in writing, like when I write music, I don't, I don't use the same part of me that mm-hmm. I do when I'm like thinking, like when I'm cons- analytically thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can, people do, and certain kinds of like very high level jazz are maybe involved with this kind of thing. But mm-hmm. at the same time, if there's not this other part engaged, for me, it's like, it just becomes more like typewriters. Like, it's like, well, yeah, but if you're yeah. into like, what's beautiful. There's like a set, it just feels right. It's like, ah, that's the, I'll try, I'll write a melody and I'll, and I'll be like, well, this part works, but this part isn't. And it's not because I have some reason that, I, you know, some like logical analysis of like, well, actually, because I moved to the third here, then I have to, it's like, no, it's just, it just like that's not it <laughs> and like well what do you mean it well it's not beautiful uh, there's something and i'm like opening myself and listening for it in a way that if i were to think analytically it would seem like i'm being a little bit crazy because i'm like well what are you listening to <laughs> right right <laughs> but it's like i'm just i'm like sensing into what is beautiful um and so like I suppose, I mean, with any kind of art, this is just the art that I know because I do music, but uh, yeah, sensing in, and that can be also outside of some traditional art medium. Like I think you sense into like what's beautiful uh, in terms of like relating with somebody, what's beautiful to do as a, like a, to, to build as a like sort of my work in the world. Um, and these aren't, it's of course like good to engage the intellect, but there's this other thing, this other way of knowing, like the more participatory kind of sensing into like what's good. Well, I think lot- that's like that's more of John's not cold calculating reason. Like this feels like it belongs with reason and mm-hmm. is part of like your character. Like you're you're you have this goal of I want to make a song, and you're you're not like analytically being reasonable but your your being is is interacting with with like your motives and your and the world and things like that so it feels very um, yeah yeah i'm like trying to me in this way it's like kind of this like or at least in this model that i was using earlier about wisdom it's kind of sensing between care and action like i'll play okay i'll play and i'll like ah yeah but no it's I mean, I am, I'm, I'm using, it's like valuing, you know, like using sort of evaluative things rather than analytical. I'm sensing into like, oh, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. Oh, that's good. That's beautiful. Um, and that's not, again, like, yeah, something I came to logically or as a result of some like sort of process of an analysis. It's just like, I can just feel it that that's what it is. And I, I think we often, Often, like at least I'm, in my life, I've discounted that aspect. Well, we, as a group, oh, we do, right? Yeah, like it's yeah. it's little kids stuff. It's it's fantasy. Yeah. It's not real. Really, yeah. business and and action, like you said, maybe action logic is real. But when you start to get in like action feeling, that's that's silly. That's little kid stuff. Yeah, and then we lose track of like. I mean, this is how we get into like real bullshitting foolishness of like I'm mm. uh, I'm like 
maybe really efficiently doing something that I shouldn't be doing in the first place. <laughs> like I'm, you know, I'm like making a lot of money. Uh, I just but... did that. Yeah, no, I just switched my work life around to sacrifice a little money for like what I just intuitively, logically, I was like battling myself, but intuitively, like I got to do this for my sanity almost. Mm. And it was like a small change. It was not some radical, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to throw everything to the wind. But it was a small but meaningful change that like analytically doesn't make sense. Like if I look at the worldview and the values of my culture, that's, that's a foolish choice, but I'm so happy and I lost nothing. I gained everything. Like it was such a simple, good choice to just embrace that part of me that I was ignoring. Um, yeah. And this is like, when you're dealing with the complexity of actual life, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't, I mean, you can try to manage it all by understanding and like having the right analysis, the right view, but like, good luck. Cause life is always way more than anything you could think about. So you have to wrestle with this uncertainty and when you can, and, and how to wrestle with it, as far as I can tell, the best way is like from the heart, from opening, from sensing in like what's good here. Uh, and yeah, it's also a matter of, as with everything, it's a matter of practicing doing that over time. Mm -hmm. You get just like, that's a part of your sense making mm -hmm. instead of this thing where you're like, okay, well, that doesn't align with what makes sense in terms of like cold calculated logic or uh, yeah, yeah. The way that you're looking right now. So like, yeah, going to the monastery was like, what am I doing? <laughs> really? I'm like, I'm just going to drop everything in my life for three months and go to hang out in a monastery. Uh, when I come back, I'm going to have to rebuild anything that I was doing before and like get things going. It's really like, what am I, this is ridiculous. Yeah, At the same time, yeah. some part of me just felt like this is really good. Like this will be really good. And, uh, and I just followed that. And out of that developed this project with John and Daniel, this whole thing that I'm working on now. And it's nothing I could have planned. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. You know, the hard part is, is like, it doesn't always, like, it's, like, it's not like some kind of, uh, you know, new age, like the secret kind of thing. Like, it's not like, oh, just follow what you think is good and your life will work out. Like, that's not entirely true. Like it can, it can not work out for a while, for sure. At the same time, for me, what is it? that it works out. I, I had an offer before I went to the monastery, I had this offer for a job, really well-paid job, like yeah. teaching at this uh, startup. Uh, they were like an incubator and they wanted me to teach people how to do startup stuff. And I was like, I could do that and get uh -huh. paid well. Uh, and I made this in the capitalist view, very illogical decision to, to, to go to the monastery where I make no money. Um, but if I would have succeeded in this other way without following what like I feel like is good, without following my sense of what's like a good life, um, then I would just have money. And right, we talked about this. And last I'd time be too. like, "What? Yeah. This makes no sense to me." And some other way, I'd like lose out on the meaning that you, that only comes through like I'm in alignment with what's good, and and what's good yeah. isn't something anybody can tell me. Like what's good is something I have to sense into. Like what is good? I, it's not. Because like, going to a monastery or teaching at a startup incubator, it's not like everybody would have taken, whoever took that job, because somebody took it, didn't make the wrong decision, like necessarily, only maybe. If they were me, it would have been the wrong decision. But maybe for them, this was like a sense into like, yeah, I really want to help entrepreneurs. And this is a venue in which I can practice like this way of being in the world that's really important to me. Um, so great. It's a great job. Perfect for me. Um, and yeah, for me, it would have just been like, well, the reasons for that were I would have the safety of a well-paid job. That was basically it. Like the rest of it wasn't, didn't, didn't light me up. Didn't make me right. feel a lot. Very similar for me. It was like just more money, which equals more like long-term safety or more long-term like comfort and stuff. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like there's a, there's a part of me that's also like, this is, this is the, a, a deep illusion like whenever I, so one of the things that I'm doing in the thing is like working on, do you know Joe Edelman? Have you ever met him? Uh, no. Uh, he, he runs uh, the, what's now called the School of Social Design. Um, back in the day, like we were working together on a project called Human Systems, where it's basically about like systems design in terms of values. Uh -huh. um, but 
he's talking about, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of putting some language on it, but I, I asked him about it. He was like, yeah, that, that seems right. So it's not, these aren't the words he uses, but they like, they, I think they are pretty good for explaining this. Uh -huh. It's like, um, there's like, uh, what he calls attention policies like what are you paying attention to sort of salience landscape but like sort of habitualized salience landscapes mm -hmm. like ways that we've decided if we, i mean maybe not consciously and through reflection but ways that we've come to like pay attention to this and that and then there are sort of two in this way of looking there are two classes we might say like fear-based attention and care-based attention okay great yeah 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 and so like the fear-based attention would have like called me toward, uh, hey, take the safe road, take this job, save up the money. If you want to go to the monastery, you can do that in a couple of years when you've mm -hmm. got more savings and you're like not so precariously situated. And the care-based attention was like, go here. Like, yeah. this is beautiful. This is such a lovely project. These people are amazing. Like you're going to, it's going to be a good experience for you. Um, I mean, there was also like, there, I wasn't sure, but that was right. my intuition. I sort of like, and, and if you follow, like, so for me, it's about like learning to trust something bigger than what causes me to go for this fear-based attention. Mm -hmm. Like I have to trust that like somehow, or I learning to learning to trust that like my life will make more sense to me, be more meaningful if I follow care-based attention. Um, and all of the systems around us are set up to like sort of maximize our fear and maximize and thereby our fear-based attention, sort of like, uh, you know, status games, uh, sort of. Mm. Yeah, uh, status is weird, right? Like there's actually yeah. a lot of good research on status and Peterson talks about like we have this hardwired status in the system. Um, mm. And yeah, if you can kind of say, okay, I have enough status. I, I don't have enough love. I don't have enough. Yeah, like love, basically. Hmm. Um, yeah, I wonder about it. Like, I mean, I get it. And I think that's true in some sense. Like, I do have, I want to be recognized for like things that I do, mm -hmm. or it feels good. It does. But I, I wonder, in the end, I wonder if it's hardwired. I mean, I know there's like a way of looking that would say, yeah, yeah of course. Of course it is. And then I also wonder like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> like or at least this can we let go of something that like it's the hardwired sounds like something you can't let go of right right there's, and there's so like, like it sounds like well you're gonna have to deal with status and your desire and need for status at all times anyway um and then i wonder because i i think i've seen people like uh who really genuinely seem to have gone beyond it it's kind of like when somebody says uh you know jealousy is hardwired yeah. Um, and you're like, well, it that seems plausible because I experience jealousies. Most people I know experience jealousy. Uh -huh. um, and then you talk to somebody who's like polyamorous for the last 20 years and they're like, I, <laughs> I actually don't experience jealousy. And you're like, huh. <laughs> like, is that real? I mean, and I, I think it is when you when I talk to them, it seems like this is a real thing. You can do a kind of work on yourself to deprogram that. Right. So well, I would say like, yeah, I wonder, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm just poking around because it's fun yeah, to yeah. do no, go ahead. in this idea of like hardwired or sort of like a deeply seated cultural program. Um, like I, it's deeply seated in me to pay attention to status that I would believe hundred mm -hmm. um, percent. Can I reform my, can I step outside of that? Can I let go of this thing that's so deep in me? Mm -hmm. um, similarly, like with jealousy, can I just let go of jealousy? Can I find a view that aligns with my care that allows me to act in a way that like actually practicing that over time, I become a person who doesn't experience jealousy. Right, right. I become yeah. a person who doesn't care about status. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 so. I really don't know. I think yeah. so, because like in, in individual difference research, there's within person variance. And so some people have very little and they're very dependable or at least consistent. Like if they're good and, and have low in-person variance, they're very dependable, right? Like you want the, the center in a football team, the guy that hikes the ball to not be a star, but to be so consistent. Like he just always does the same behavior every time. Hmm. But then you can widen that, right? Like even if he's kind of like born that way, um, 
he can still become more within person. In fact, fact, meditation is probably one of the biggest ways Rick might say to open up your within person variants, right? Like you just start having Mm -hmm. more variety within your consciousness or within your behavioral um, kind of range. And you kind of like learn that the same way it's hard if you're the kind of person that's always five or 10 minutes late, it's hard to use a calendar, but it's possible, you (laughs) know? And, and I think that's where it becomes like, you don't want to have too many of these goals at once. Um, or I think being inspired by other people is kind of a good way to take, learn new habits like that and say like, oh, you know, what would Nathan do? He'd be on time. Let me see if I can just be a little peppier or whatever, like, you know, would get him there on time. And then hmm. through that kind of like aspirational um, process, then maybe I'm widening my, my, you know, whatever's in the back of my head that's like enacting the actions, like I'm giving it new uh, patterns to to throw out into the world yeah this is what joe talks about a lot with mm-hmm. uh with values i mean he calls these sort of care-based attention things values which is confusing for the whole discussion sometimes because then people say well like i value like he's well i can't like some people value status and it's like well he's he would say probably like well <laughs> that's not a value whatever but like like i like this care-based fear-based attention because then we can say well like even if we all call all of that values care-based attention um is often distributed through networks through this inspiration like uh Ooh, you see more, somebody yeah. you see somebody being a certain way and you're like and you just say it resonates with your care like with your heart with your oh wow topic like, sense you're like yeah it's oh, not logical wow, what a way to be that's amazing i i really want to be that way um and this is yeah, you like learn these cool ways. I mean, you can also learn it from experience, sort of like you you tried this way and you're running into the same wall over and over. Well, yeah, of and course. Yeah. You, you like figure out this, you have this insight into a new way of caring about things that might like be better. Uh-huh. Uh, take more things into account that you care about. Um, but, but yeah, often it's just being inspired by somebody in the way that they are that like can open up your... Uh, care-based attention to see something else like so uh-huh. I've got a, my salience landscape shifts because now I've interacted with John and I see his like maybe before I was really into debating and be having the right view right. Like, blah, 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 blah. and then I interact with John and it's like wow this like good faith sort of like willing to just like throw everything I think out the window if the better argument is coming out of the other yeah. side of this conversation <laughs> um like that's so inspiring like i want to be like that and then you start to practice it and then you start to train your attention to like your salience landscape to like tune into this Mm -hmm. and thereby like adapting and growing um in this in this sort of care-based attention way well i love how this is not really like the way people picture rationality right like decide and do this Mm -hmm. is like live and notice and then like care about other people and then through that you start to care about yourself differently Um, yeah i mean it's it's like there's so much complexity in it but like oh yeah yeah, yeah. but basically yes like i think so like you're you're really if you can if you can i mean the first thing that it seems like you have to do is sort of clear at least enough of this emotional blockage that you can feel inspired Mm. so like for me for a very long time i was so that I couldn't like I couldn't tune into that I kind of like there's part of uh there's part of our sort of nihilistic relativism that's like cultural and philosophical and intellectual but I think another part of it for 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 me at least and I think for a lot of other people comes from just being so shut down and hurt by living in the system Uh and like maybe being surrounded by people who also don't really like know how to do that and teach you and like hold yeah. you and love you in a way that allows you to do that. Um, until you can sort of find a way to like bring love to all of that pain and let it go, you don't see very clearly like that this is all around all the time. Like I could just constantly look for like, what's a really inspiring, cool way to approach my life today um yeah yeah exactly like, right that's how you should get out of bed that's how you yeah. should actually kind of wake up and go okay well what is this this blessing i'm given called a day how can yeah. i just fill it with my own joy or vision or or yeah. savoring and, and stuff like that yeah. yeah and that gets like blocked by 
I mean, initially there's the view blocks like, okay, well, the only thing that's real is physical material reality. <laughs> all of this like stuff that's happening on top of it, all the meaning you're putting on it, that's just bullshit. Right. Like, that's the, that's one way that blocks it. And another way that blocks it is like, okay, I can't feel my body and feel that like sort of the beauty of a sunset like is, is close to me because I'm so uh, cramped up in like my feelings of, uh, yeah, like uh, oh, yeah. helplessness or, or other, like these other. I used to relating to this as you talk, like to go back to the energy by so I can feel like, oh yeah, he's right. Like I just feel it in my body. What you're talking yeah, when about. you're when you're if you're like stuck in what the Buddhists call papancha, like this sort of ruminations about like you know, and you're stuck in this view, and it's like oh, there's this issue, and it's like oh, you're definitely not noticing the beauty of the sunset. And when you can yeah, like learn, right? That, you're in your own, yeah. yeah, like Eeyore. Yeah. I was thinking of Eeyore in like Winnie the Pooh. He's just like, he's <laughs> Eeyore at the river when his friends visit. He's still Eeyore. It's like your friends are here. Eeyore smile until they leave. At least you know, yeah. Then mope, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's so hard to like just like ah, open up like that i mean so whatever works to get you out of that but then and then there's also like you know for a lot of folks um i mean i'm really lucky in terms of like i do get to wake up and think about and just like with a lot of agency decide how i'm gonna live today what i'm gonna do mm-hmm. um and for a lot of folks it's like I got to go to work and I got to be there on time and I got to work 12 hours. And when I get home, I got to like clean the house and take care of the kids. And then I got to like go to bed uh, and get up and do it again tomorrow. And there's just like no space to like right. really. That's, that's the, the, the model, the um, uh, forgetting the name, but where like the, the, you have something safe behind you and you have like a Vista in front of you. I'm just blanking on the name. John talks about it sometimes. It's like an engineering based model where um, all like mammals seem to enjoy locating themselves in spaces where they can kind of just see openness in front of them, but Hmm. know there's like a wall behind them. (laughs) Like that's what we like. And like cats do this, right? Like you go to a house with a cat, like that's where they are. um, Perched up, we're looking out. (laughs) But yeah, but they're not just hiding. They're hiding yeah. while they're opportunizing or something like yeah. that. Like they're they're seeking goodness and feeling safe from badness. So it's like a cat ataraxia or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like just as a as an animal, I'm like now I live in an environment in which this isn't actually I'm not usually in danger. And that's another thing I have to kind of like teach my nervous system. But like, right, yeah. It would make sense that I would want to be aware of the environment and feel like all the parts that I can't directly observe right now, there's no threat coming from there either. And then I can uh-huh. like, ah, this is good. Yeah. 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 And then you can like ponder good ideas or practice yeah. with a friend or something like that. If you can get that, that space to breathe or that, like, even like a little bit, like, I don't like routines a whole lot. I think they can be kind of these double-edged swords. If you get really good at habits, you just live in this habit, but like, some stability that looks like a routine can just be like wonderful for that kind of person that's in this kind of panic state that they don't have time mm-hmm. to really um just notice the sunset i think that's a great kind of like a uh, anchor to these kind of things yeah and i mean i feel like this is something that if you can get tuned into it enough it just becomes like self-evident that it's good and right, like, right. Yeah, why would I do anything else? At the same time, like I lived for such a long time unable to tune into that. Mm-hmm. And when I look at the sort of process of coming out of that, uh it's it was years, years and years and years. And I'm still like not you know perfectly attuned to like my sense of the good, the true, and the beautiful at all times. Like, <laughs> certainly not. I'm not, I'm not enlightened. Is that possible? But I think I think it is. Okay. I think it is. Okay, I think like, like, people who are like legit enlightened uh-huh. are just doing that. Like they're, they're, they're tuned into their sense of like uh, care and their view will like, they'll take whatever view helps them to act in a way that like is an expression of this care. So mm, just high, you know, high, high like, cognitive flexibility. Just incredible. It's like a fluidity that's yeah. like only comes through like completely letting go of fear. And so it's just care-based attention, like 24 hours a day. <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. 
it seems like um it seems like some kind like uh, often people talk about like enlightened people as uh or the like pe- just general folks not like people who are in the sphere of buddhism or enlightenment but like okay. they'll talk about them as like think about like oh it's this person who's like sort of transcended they live on a different plane they're like they're they're totally connected you know it's like no they just like have completely like like it's doing a certain kind of work like like i'm doing like you're doing like practicing over a long period of time and with the kind of intensity and dedication that allowed them to completely let go of fear-based attention so they're not doing anything out of this fear out of like uh the fear i mean you could say fear like you could even include maybe like, uh, yeah, like desire that isn't contributing to flourishing. They're just caring, like, mm-hmm. and and that's it. And to me, this is kind of my definition of enlightenment. If somebody hmm. claims to be enlightened, uh, which in the first place would be like, and that's a little bit of a red flag for me. I'm like, oh, okay. Like maybe you could maybe if you are enlightened, you probably aren't really walking around talking about it all the time. Hey guys, guess what? I did it again. I'm still enlightened. Yeah. Yeah, because then it's like okay, maybe maybe there is a kind of status thing going on there for you. Uh But if somebody is like, let's say the other people are pointing to someone and saying this person is enlightened, right? I'm looking at her and I'm like, "Mm, is is her do her actions always accord with an expression of care? Like, is, is she really only functioning in care-based attention, has insights that allow her, like the insights of like, have completely let go of the self and the ego and the idea of separateness and individua- individual individuality. She's completely tuned into herself as part of this inextricable web of, the, of, of like existence to the point that all of her actions are an expression of like care-based attention. And if so, I'd be like, that's, that's about as close to enlightenment as I can imagine a person getting like that, that to me, that's enlightenment. And so I'm certainly not enlightened. I'm not even close to enlightened. Um, And I notice it every time I notice, I find myself being guided by fear-based attention by sort of like, oh, you can't treat me like that. Or, oh, I got to like, make sure that I like, you know, make this uh, project work or like, I've got to fit into this group and I, I people need to like me and like, you know, like, um, right. Right. And it's all this stuff. Like, yeah. yeah defensive but it's just like stuff. habituated ways of paying ways of attending to things. And right. you can, you can rid yourself of it. It's like the strongest reason in my mind to go live in the monastery sort of more perm, like, well, at least for some years, yeah. I haven't, I haven't like made that leap. I have some other reasons. I'm like I'm a father. I have yeah, an 11 yeah. year old. I, I have, you know, to not do it. And at the same time, like the call of it is that is like, what if my whole life were like looking at a sunset? Like, <laughs> well, it's, just, yeah, it's, it's a time thing, right? It's just quicker. It's the most effective path to that like kind of permanent state would be mm. uh, just the, the the space and the the guidance to have the intensity to then like progress to that point yeah Um, and i mean there's there are also i think good reasons to say like not everyone needs to this doesn't need to be everyone's goal like not everyone needs to completely drop all sense of ego and self and just dedicate themselves fully to uh their life as an expression of love like uh, it's a worthy goal but it doesn't (laughs) need to be everyone's goal sure um and so like it's kind of like, um, to my mind, the difference between if you wanted to be like a top level athlete mm-hmm. or you just want to be like reasonably in shape. And it's like the difference between being reasonably in shape and being like really out of shape for like your life, your, the, the quality of your life is bigger than being in shape and top level athlete. Like mm-hmm. that's a difference. It's an important difference. It's like, I certainly can't do things that like, I can't go run a marathon right now if I wanted to, Mm -hmm. but if I didn't exercise and boulder and do these other things, like, and I just sat around all the time, my quality of life would be significantly, this, this gap is bigger than that. You know what I mean? And, um, I think, well, yeah, and that's even like almost the better gap to jump, right? Just going from the negative up to the positive, 
then you're a functional person again. You're able to actually just like be the bigger person in like pettiness or accomplish what you want without guilt or fear or all these things or yeah. just uh, open up to your loving self. Like all of these things, like that's a good life. Like just getting to yeah. that point. You don't need to be, uh, you know, this glowing ball of Taoism or something just like sheening through people you can just yeah. function as a healthy yeah. and you're inspiring people too just by being a healthy person so you're actually doing your goal of like giving it back or spreading that just by being like a healthy person in front of other people that are less healthy than you that's um, right yeah and I think in a similar way like learn practicing getting in tune with care-based attention you know, you can have this goal of be, being the like Olympic athlete of that, like one of the, like an enlightened being, which is an amazing goal and go for it. Like if you have the desire and the drive, like I think I have nothing but respect for that. Uh -huh. um, and even if you don't like have that desire and drive, like just getting to where like, just making that difference between like, I'm not being guided by fear all the time. I'm actually being guided by care. Uh, and and that difference, I think, is probably similarly, to my mind, is similarly the bigger gap. Mm -hmm. Like, if I just yeah. live my life, like, crunched up and fearing, trying to muddle through, or if I live yeah, my yeah. life sort of, like, heart open, it's like, okay, here we are. This is a wild ride. I'm only here for, like, as Rumi says, like, I'm here for half a breath, like, <laughs> oh, only love. <laughs> like, here we go. Uh, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's that's the the desire to put in the effort, I think, is to see the returns on that and to be that kind of person like to aspire to be that kind of person and even like you said just being a consistent meditator or consistent meditator plus circling plus like four or five by the other practices like just doing kind of those basic things you meet people that are in their like 50s and 60s that have been kind of doing that and you go like oh they're just happy grounded people like they just yeah. seem uh, i like being around them they're always super nice to me they're you know and and they don't seem like they're trying to sell me the secret but they just feel like they've gotten to that grounded place where they're not full of that whatever that other thing is that we've been talking about um, yeah and like ultimately if there's a reason for somebody who hasn't started down that path it's like when you're around that person and you're around somebody who's not like that and you just pay attention to like how good is their life like, what kind of life do I want to have? Do I want to have a life? Like, when I'm around, uh, you know, Benita Roy, for example, yeah. when I'm hanging out with her, like, I mean, only online, I'm, she, she lives in Connecticut, I think, or something, but uh -huh, yeah, we're right. hanging out and talking, and I'm just like, man, like, you have, you just have a way of being here with me that is, like, great. It is, and I yes, I've her too, yeah. yeah. And when right. you, you meet you somebody who's like, like relaxing like, soup almost, it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you meet somebody who's like, you know, maybe a very successful business person, um, but they're full of neuroses and like trying to, and they're trying to like, you know, pump up their status and make sure you see how amazing they are and like, well, you know, and they're just like driven in this other way by like fear based attention. Mm. And just like, yeah, I could do that. I don't know. I think, um, for me, like this memento mori thing, like I've just been coming more and more, maybe yeah. I'm not 40, 43 now, but like just coming to this like vision of like, yeah, I'm going to die. So how do, how do I want to play this thing? <laughs> it's like, oh, this grounded, like sort of loving, open, connected way seems like a, seems like just clearly the good way. Like I could build up a bunch of, you know, chips or I could like, be really connected to people well you're right the, the 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 meditation on death do you when you're at the monastery did they ever just have death meditations or talk about death or mortality or um, so we talked stuff? about it but um it's cons like i i just been doing it on my own like i know that um sort of it's it's like for we had various levels um of like sort of how much people had been meditating when they were with us and so i think i think it's kind of like not a beginner thing to do okay. just because <laughs> you could probably like spin off in the wrong direction like it's supposed to open your heart and it might just make you like really desperately afraid yeah um but and so i, I we didn't ever like i didn't receive instruction to do that but um i think 
Yeah, it's when you're at a place where you can turn and tune into what's good. It's just another way of like strengthening that uh, care based attention to say like, you know, this is a very temporary fleeting experience that I'm having. I'm going to die. How, how, how does it like make any sense to be afraid? Like, you know, it's like, I, cause the fear in some sense is like, if you, it's not good. I don't, I don't want to like, you know, demonize fear-based attention. It's like, I'm trying to protect myself. Right. Uh, well, we I want to have a relationship to both, way. right? John says yeah. that you don't want to demonize that system. It's, but it wants to, you want it to be behind you or in the background or like a resource, right? You just want, don't want it on all the time. That's really. Yeah. I mean, okay. So like, if you, if you just shut it, because yeah, you can like, you could just, in order to try to be just living by care-based attention, you could shut that down. Oh, just ignore that's it. Bad. And that's yeah, spiritual yeah, yeah. bypass. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, don't do that. Yeah. It's just like, what is driving me? Uh, I want what's driving me to be care-based attention. And I have to be aware of my fear-based attention because I don't get rid of it. Like when I talk about an enlightened person, I don't think it's somebody who never is afraid of anything. Well, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 It's a they're harmony not, with those things. Not yeah. Like they're not driven by the fear to act. They're like aware of the fear and then they are aware of the care and then they choose to care. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, like when, when I look at it, I'm like, well, you know, it, I mean, it depends always about the frame. Like you could say, well, a connection is a kind of status. It's like, yeah, okay. But like, other, I mean, if you just look at like status in terms of like socially people regard me as like, I am a successful person. Like versus I have, you know, like five really close friends who care about me and will be there for me if the shit hits the fan. Like what, like it's the second one is so clearly to me, like the better life. Like I could give a shit if people, you know, if I'm famous, but if I have like some really good friends uh, who deeply care about me, yeah, like that feels like, oh, this is a really good way. I'll, I'll have a good life. Um, and so like, just, I don't know, it's this, it's weird because we're confronted with these other messages and brought up to believe them. And there's the whole game is set up to make you think like actually being rich and famous and powerful are like the most important things. And it's like, I don't know. I'm a little bit skeptical of myself because sometimes I think I'm a little bit allergic to some of those things. And I want to be and like, again, yeah, it's like talked about power. When we were yeah. talking last time, you said like there was power was one of the three things in some model you were sharing. You wanted people oh, yeah. to be like, yeah. uh, at, at Maple, it's wisdom, power, and love. Right. So power is one of those three. They don't want you to be impotent and weak and cowardly. They want you to have an empowered sense. And then what do you say? Wisdom and love. Yeah. So what's, what's yeah. the difference in that model, I guess, between those two? Cause I wouldn't say they're kind of similar to me. Yeah. So like, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say I'm the person to ask, but okay, in, my, in my understanding, it's like a kind of, you could map it on to this, like, a deeper version actually you could you could map it onto a deeper version of the thing that i was saying like with the view care and action okay like view being then in some sense like well for the average person they're gonna be like well i have views and i can have insights into like how i can more elegantly accomplish my goals and that's the way of looking at it like great and if you go really deep into that into what like i I would think of as wisdom in the the maple frame, but again, I'm not like speaking for what that actually would be. That'd I just be, thought it was cool you brought up power. Else. I think it's really interesting but, for people to talk about power in a healthy way. Well, yeah. So, like, if I recognize that, like, in the view sense, I am, like, I am constituting a self world moment to moment. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what's actually happening. There's not a me, a self. And there's not a world in that sense. Like I am creating, I'm fabricating it moment to moment. Mm-hmm. And there's this like love that I'm born of. Uh, this like deep care. And then my actions are like power, like ma- taking action in the world to bring to, as an expression of my deep care through this like self that I can like, I basically like choose the self in the world that would be the best expression of my deep care so that I can act in a way that will do that. And, and so for power, at least as far as I understand it for them, it's like, part of it is my, is like 
the actions that I take in the world. And part of it is like, and, and, and the sort of extension of that is like, how can I bring other people, how can I sort of argue for a way of looking? And that's an expression of care that can like bring other people around to seeing things my way, seeing things in this way. Like this is also an okay, expression. Okay. So yeah. power is a social turning and is a social moving thing. And then- Well, like, yeah, what... I mean, not only, but also like, I mean, cause social, if we talk about social just in terms of like the human world, it's more than that, but it's also that. Like, so the human world, but also just like in relation to all beings, like what, how do my actions, I have power uh, and I can pretend, in some ways I can pretend that I don't, but I do anyway. No, and then on great. the other hand, like, I can be cognizant of the power that I have and put it into use for that, which is most worth loving that, which is like, okay. So there's the love part is towards mm. loving. And then where's the wisdom? The wisdom in that sense is like sort of like the, the having the view of myself and the world as something that I'm that I have agency over. Like it's not it's not I'm not okay. subject to it. There's something deeper than the way that I'm looking like. So it can be easy to I, I mean, and most of us go through the world in a way where we're kind of identifying with ourself, the self, the con self concept we have and the idea we have of the world. And if you are actually wise you're kind of stepping outside of that and saying like ah i'm creating this self and i'm creating the world and then you can learn to have agency over like what self am i creating what world am i creating how what, what way am i oh, looking okay so there's the situational judgment and the um, sensitivity to the like moment and to your thoughts in the moment yeah i mean so like there's it, it all is, yeah you know, but but yes like That's so cool. I think I think as far as I understand them with wisdom, it's the the idea of knowing that the way that you're looking is not the way that it is and gaining agency okay. over your way of looking. That makes sense so from you can, the, you can choose the true. way of looking. Yeah. That that like is an expression of the deep care that well, leads awesome. to the actions. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I think I love so. this stuff. It's you so should ask Daniel. I will, he, yeah. He'd be much better I don't equipped know him, but to would, explain yeah. that. <laughs> Well, because it's so interesting because I always think of Buddhists as these reticent kind of withdrawn people, but like mm. the power part is very much not that. It's it's very much. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and it's like uh, that that is a way to be Buddhist is to just bliss out in a cave and that's it. Um, and then there's like the, this is a more like bodhisattva kind of returning to the world in some ways very resonant with like Plato's cave you, know? like, you don't, those you don't go out and see the sun and then just walk out and live in the sun now like in in this like an anal or what is an analogy you you go out you see the sun and then you come back and you try to talk to everybody be like hey <laughs> over there hey, Alcibiades um, oh my gosh <laughs> let me talk to you yeah. oh my god have you seen me lately oh my god yeah yeah, yeah. You're bringing it all back. Yeah. 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 So this is very much like for them, it's not just about blissing out. It's about like mm -hmm. sort of bringing love and deep compassion to the world and like trying to combine wisdom, love, and power. Um, uh -huh. Giving people who have power, wisdom, and love, and give people who have wisdom and love, give them power. Um, oh, that's so interesting. It's like a, it's like a balancing model where you use the, the lack you feel the lack or something with the other yeah i mean two. it's often just the way that our system is set up is like people in power often don't have wisdom and love right they're, yeah yeah yeah. i mean they may have it in their personal lives but like what they're doing especially socially isn't you don't benefit from that in a capitalist system you benefit from power um so like getting everybody to follow my vision and my lead and here we go mm -hmm. uh that's how you get power in the capitalist system Hmm. uh convincing everybody to buy my product yeah, yeah but that doesn't have too much to do with like love and express making sure that like what i'm convincing you to buy is an expression of care for the flourishing of all beings like that's not usually it's, not, it's definitely not intrinsic to the thing and so it's not usually at the forefront um and people who are very concerned about the flourishing of all beings uh don't usually have a lot of power they're usually just like, you know, a grandma. <laughs> well, that sounds like, like agreeable <laughs> people see the power, right? Like the more agreeable you are, the more you like to take the fall in conflict, right? So if you have this one group 
that is kind of heartless and happy to take advantage and one group that would like rather not argue and would rather just give a little bit of power to avoid arguing you end mm. up with this dynamic where like the, the person the careless person keeps getting more power from the caring people just because yeah. that's how people negotiate in this kind of yeah we've built a kind of like sociopathic hierarchy in some sense yeah because like i'm nice to people at mcdonald's not to brag about how awesome i am but like <laughs> like i'll say like just take your time i'm in no hurry because i'm just not like in a, and they're like you're the nicest person we've met in weeks. And I'm like, <laughs> just because I'll give you an extra 45 seconds of my day. And that makes me into like a saint or something like yeah, that. Like wild, it's horrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, complex problems, but like addressing, addressing them through simple practices and trying to spread those practices, I think is something worth, worth taking a shot at. Well, yeah, it's amazing. I, I mean, feel like, I feel like, in some ways, like I'm so lucky, I have such a privileged life to like have the time to do these things, to reflect, to, like have this, you know, and I'm not like, I mean, maybe I, I don't have like tons of money and I don't have all this thing, but I have time. And that's not, and that's like not something most people have. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this whole talk that we've been having about like how to do this, like sort of uh, developing yourself and becoming more in tune with what you care about. And I think there's a whole other discussion about like, how do we build systems in which like people don't have to mm -hmm. like bust their ass for 12 hours a day at McDonald's in order to like pay their like crappy landlord and not get kicked out of their apartment. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like these are, there, there's a whole world of like the systems in which we're embedded that make it so hard to do these things mm -hmm. that if we, if we had a different system, I mean, not as a, it's not a panacea, but for example, a universal basic income mm -hmm. would allow people to go. We, we wrote this, uh, there, I don't know if they wrote it. There was an article that one of the people at the monastery was thinking about writing about like how cheap it was for us to live there. Yeah, yeah. They were like, eight of us and I think our like entire budget was like something like uh 4,000 5,000 Canadian a month like it was like insane like yeah, yeah. To, to say $600 like hundred dollars a month or something you're it's just that. like yeah. we just and we had such a rich experience of in our lives just being there and it's just like yeah this is not uh this isn't accessible for some people but it's not like oh we would have we can't do that it's like, oh, we totally can do that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how I started. A lot of how I started was just giving up like weak habits and like, oh, I, I have these robots. I used to like to play with these computer robots and they play video games and do the games. And at one point I even sold them. And so I like, it was fun because I was programming and I was like getting the games to do stuff. And then I realized like, I'm just spending like 15 minutes most mornings managing this program and if I just stop managing this program, I have 15 free minutes. Hmm. And like, if you could just stop doing a little bit of these things, which were like intellectually, even like financially, the robots, I could get to make like 50 or hundred dollars an hour sometimes. Like, and mm -hmm. I'd go like, stop tinkering because like your creativity is being given away there. And if you hmm. can just like get some time and creativity back, that'll probably pop up somewhere way better than in some virtual world that you don't care about. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But I guess for me, it's just like also, I do have to run actually pretty soon. But oh, yeah, it's also yeah, for like, sure. Thank you so much. It's also that. important to, to recognize like there are like larger systemic issues that, that make it really hard for a lot of people to, to, no, to have. Yeah. We're both lucky. And, both of us. Yeah. And well, this is just like, I think it's just good to, to, to like call that to mind whenever we're talking like this because. It's like, not, not to say like only, oh, I'm so lucky. Oh, you know, and, and that's good. Have gratitude. At the same time though, like just to say like, there's another front on which this uh, battle needs to be fought, which is how could we change the systems in which people live that would give them more time, more space, more access to like resources and methods and tools and practices. Um, because like, yeah, it shouldn't be like this is this is maybe maybe the deep point. It shouldn't be that you have to be lucky. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it should be it should everywhere. Be like, I agree. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like so easy and supported that like people live this way and this is the way that we are. It's kind of like um, that's to me like the deep bodhisattva view is like 
I don't want to only help you do the hard thing. I want to put you in a situation in which doing the hard thing is super supported and easy, you know, like, so yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's too much for any of it is too much for any of us to take on alone, but that's where like, I don't know if who's got the right, uh, who's got, who's got a good model, but like people like Tristan Harris and Joe Edelman and these guys who are like working on like systems design and like really saying like, what is it to make ethical technology? What is it to make like, mm -hmm. how could we redesign, you know, um, Glenn Wales and how could we redesign like voting and economics and yeah, yeah. like to, to really like say like the container that we're in matters a lot and we could distribute this much more widely. People could be much more freed up to like, tap into their own wisdom to their benefit but also to the benefit of the entire everybody. world yeah everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no i agree and that's why like it, it is just just um being in the world acting the way you do is like putting that in the world and mm. then if you can make it even more systems like that's even better like you said and yeah give people the you know the the space to have the time to do the practices and to cultivate like the the network of friends that could actually just like replace your consumerism or your depression or your um anxiety and stuff yeah 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 and i think like so i think it's like what i'm most excited about at the moment is like how people how these two things interact like creating small scale cultures of people who could like model that and and actually like as john's talking about like steal the culture you know like Mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. people's idea of what's possible we're really open right now because corona shut down the world and so yeah. people like suddenly realized like oh this isn't the only way that we could move in the world and mm -hmm. i'm not just like so caught up in my the grind that you know i had some time to reflect on like how am i living and so my hope is that we emerge from this um there will be at least some new experiments and models that like show people hey there's a different way uh, yeah so. yeah yeah no i love seeing all of john's guests that do the same thing and talk about these and i'm so interested and in, i join groups like this and 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 it just works just my life is better your life is amazing it sounds like you're just always full of joy and thought and um <laughs> you are like I, I i don't know it's it's you were probably like that before you committed to all these practices you seem like a very like pro-life kind of just full of vitality person but it's, it's it's um, it's both ways, brother. If you were hanging out with me all the time, there's like, you know, there's a range. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> but it's working for you. I mean, like you're, yeah, it you're does. it does. You've cultivated a, a way of life that's actually like flourishing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And when I look like in comparison to myself, like let's say 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. They, they, there's where I'm like, oh, okay. So I do have a lot of volatility. I do have a lot of like emotional, like, swings and i'm trying to deal with and like stabilize and understand yeah yeah but i'm like the the range is up here where it used to be down here so i've, I've moved right that's how i feel too yeah if you can find some like kind of punctuated equilibrium i think that's actually probably how it works is just boom boom <laughs> boom and you just kind of like the slow crawl up to the top of the mountain or back down to the bottom if you're trying to bring it all back or whatever but yeah <laughs> um, well great nathan can we start practicing once in a while like maybe even once a month or once every couple months and just next time maybe sit for 20 minutes or doing like i said with the email like do a group practice with rick or something like yeah, that. yeah i've been yeah i've been considering like what would be uh, a way to bring people together and do that kind of stuff anyway so like yeah we can maybe i have a bunch of friends i can invite eight people if you wanted to ever just yeah. try to have like a virtual sangha or things like yeah, that. yeah we can try it out and see what happens see what's good yeah i got a couple of ideas and uh we can i'm happy to like test them out and try it out yeah well Let's great yeah i'm very open-minded and so are a lot of my friends so all right be good well great cool. thank you so much nathan and yeah uh, yeah, just I love hearing about John's work, of course, and, and I've been spending more time with Rick as well. And um, so, yeah, just this whole this whole thing, it's great to be a part of something bigger, I guess is probably a good way to say it. Yeah, man, it's really nice to talk to you. I'll see you again soon. All right, Nathan, it was great to talk to you too. Have a good day. You too.